now we've got those those gyms excited about having an opportunity to fight at Lion Fight. And we've talked to uh, Duke Rufus and a few other folks about doing some other regional shows to help kind of build our fan base and our fighter base. Uh, getting kids to come to the fight, and, and you know, it was amazing. I was, I was at a gym one time, and these two little kids were talking, and they were hitting a heavy bag, and the one guy goes, I'm going to be Joe Schilling, you be Simon Marcus. That's awesome. And you start wow. thinking about that impact that it has, and that's, that makes you feel really good about what you're doing. I'm going to put my money on the kid that said he was Simon Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> and and th that's such a great fight. I mean, you talk about, you know, Levin, like a, a collector of belts. I mean, he pretty much owns every European belt that exists. And Simon Marcus, undefeated, you know, ha has two victories over a guy like Joe Schilling. I mean, and for the first ever Lion Fight light heavyweight title, I mean, and you brought the title, by the way, nifty, pretty, oh, yeah, pretty yeah. looking belt. You know, yeah. congratulations <laughs> on that. Thank you. Uh, but what was it like finally to be able to decide, hey, you know, it's time that we have more belts here? Yeah, I think we wanted to uh, identify ourselves. You know, we kind of took a page. I've dealt with the different sanctioning bodies, and you know, they're they're everybody has their own issues and agendas and things like that. And we decided we'll take a page from the UFC's, you know, book and say. You know, we'll brand ourselves. We want people to identify American like Muay Thai it. with Lion Folk. Well, yeah, and you know, that, th that's really the main thing. If you do things properly, it could be done, and it should be done that way. You know, why go into different organizations and pay them the sanctioning fees Right. you can keep everything in-house? You know, I've never been a, a big advocate of, you know, the inboxing, the WBC, WBO, that type of thing. It's so all the, right. the alphabet. Yeah. That's all yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't want to be part of that. So we're, th we're, we're thrilled with the belt. I'm glad you guys liked it. We're oh. very proud of the belt. So now moving forward, this is the first ever belt being awarded, uh, uh, light heavyweight. What's the next title you're going to be introducing? Correct. Well, it's going to depend. We're negotiating with some Thai fighters. You know, we had Yods and Clyde here yep. in January. It was an honor. Uh, we're looking at bringing him back probably in July. So we want the best fighters out there in each weight class. And uh, we're not going to do a lot of belts, but we're going to handpick the fights that we think are deserving of the Lion Fight World Title Belt. You know, random just facts, you know, Artem Levin actually, he lost, but he fought Yodson Klai. One of his three losses. Yeah, <laughs> year, I think it's almost like eight, nine years ago, but that's how that's how long he's been in the sport, and that's well, that's how, you know, how young he was back then to fight. Now he's a light heavyweight to be fighting at middleweight, right? Or no, lightweight, that's what, yep. 156, lightweight. Yep. Crazy. Artem's a big guy. I picked him up at the airport the other day. He's 6'3 he's plus. He's a big boy. He's tall and lanky, and, and you know, Simon, you've seen him fight. The guy's just a wrecking ball. He's a physical specimen, so that's the other thing about having some of these bigger fighters. You know, when you're sitting ringside and you, you hear these punches, or you, you feel these kicks and these knees. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. You hear that shin on, that bone on bone crack. Literally, it echoes through the arena. I don't know if, I'm always there live, and I, I watch the replay, so I don't know if people at home Get the get the same feeling, but it literally sounds like two two by fours being cracked together. I mean, and it's like it's not just that you hear it, you feel the impact. <laughs> they, you know? they get it from the crowd because usually you hear the ooh right right after every shot. No, yeah. that and you know that's a great analogy is is two two by fours hitting each other because that's what you're doing. You literally it's bone against bone, and there's no better way to check a kick than bone against bone. That's it. And those leg kicks too. You those do come off because you hear that thud in there, and that it's like a, it makes. There's no sound quite like it on earth. The, the, the <laughs> thud of the the shin bone being turned into the thigh. It's just ugh. And Yods and Clyde's body kicks. You, you know, you saw Ooh. that last fight. You know, he hit. Gregory's a tough guy, European champion, no joke. And you could just see him melt under the pressure because Yods and Clyde had so much power on that left kick. It was very impressive to watch. I've never seen him live. Uh, to fight live before, but that was very impressive and so fast. Yeah, yeah. and so humble though. Just hanging out with him beforehand, we got to interview him, and he was just like, he almost had that Fedor, humble mystique about him. Just like that kind of half smile, like just, I'm cool with whatever. Hey guys, hey. Yeah. Like no, you can't tell by looking at me that I am a killer, <laughs> certified <laughs> card carrying killer. You know, but just so nice, so friendly and, and humble, just a, a, a true ambassador of the sport. Yep, he's one of those guys, and you know. You guys have been around fighters, you know, most of your life. They're they're usually the nicest people you'll ever want to meet. And uh, Yachts and Clyde was a perfect gentleman. He did everything we asked him to do, and then some. And every pitcher, everybody had asked him for a pitcher autograph. And I didn't realize how popular he was even in the United States until we put that fight on. And I had people saying, emailing me, saying, "We'll give anything." You know, my husband. It would be his dream to take a picture with Yachts and Clyde. Those kinds of things. Again, they're they're very reaffirming 
reaffirming to to what we're trying to do. Oh yeah, that's cool. Now, Artem Levin, this is his first time fighting in the U.S. Is this his first time in Vegas, in the States? First time in Las Vegas, yeah. Wow. And uh, he'd never been there. I drove him down the strip the other night. Uh, it was uh, myself and three Russians. They spoke no English. I speak <laughs> just, a, just a tad. And I just let him take in the sights. We drove down the strip uh, Sunday night, and they were just in awe. They, they loved Vegas. Yeah, well, so you know, there's, cool. there's no place like Vegas. You go all over the world. You go to Rio. You go to Tokyo. There's no place like Vegas, man, to fight. There just isn't. Do you think Simon Marcus, having fought in Vegas a few times, and being from North America, is used to being here, is used to fighting in the States, has fought on American TV? Because it's different, you know. Uh, uh, Artem's never fought on American TV. He's, he's been televised before across the world, but nothing like, nothing like a production or an American TV production. Do you think that gives Simon Marcus an advantage in this fight? You know, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe a bigger issue would be uh, the weather coming from the climates. Both are coming from a foot of snow. You know, Simon's coming from Canada, and... Uh, Artem said he left a foot of snow in Moscow when they left, so uh, they're happy to be here, obviously, for the weather reasons, but acclimating to the, the desert air, and, you know, I think uh, Artem came out early enough. He came out Sunday night. Uh, I'm going to go meet him after this for a workout, and, uh, you know, Simon's done the routine before, so I think, it, you know, there might be a slight advantage for him that way. And, and Las Vegas is like 3,000 feet elevation. Yeah, it is. It? You it know, is. So, it's higher. You know, a lot of people think as we're in the desert that we're down to the ground level, but you know, we're, we're up there. Yeah, I yeah. get that reality check every time I drive Summerlin Parkway. All of a sudden, the <laughs> ear pops. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like, like a thousand feet yeah, in the that's air. That's because you're driving too fast, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I drive like a grandma. It's, you know what? <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But, yeah, so I'm excited about this fight. I, th I, think, uh, I think it has the, the makings to be a classic war. And what better, off, what, what better way to kick off the first ever light heavyweight championship for Lions fight than between the two best guys in the world? Right, right. We're thrilled. And uh, I know the Muay Thai community, not only in the U.S., but outside of the... Uh, I've got many calls. Everybody's trying to get access TV and how they can watch the fight. And uh, uh, we've had a couple of Russian companies that have called that want to broadcast it back to Russia. So Andrew Simon at Axis is, is negotiating with them and actually some folks from Thailand that are interested in doing it. So our company which has just been here you know a little over two years we're already recognized internationally so we're we're thrilled with it and like i said earlier the bottom line is it's the fights right well, it's all well, about the fights well, well but let me ask you what gives you that recognition after two years because a lot of people have done that well i think that we've done it on a consistent basis and we keep raising the bar every time uh, all of the fighters that come here we do i think the little things that maybe gets lost sometimes in other promotions. And I want the fighters to enjoy their experience here. I want them to enjoy Las Vegas. Christine and I do, you know, a lot of things that way. Um, taking Artem out, taking him down the strip, and I take him out to dinner and just kind of develop a personal relationship with a lot of these fighters so we're not just shuttling in new fighters and getting them out and bringing in the next batch. I want them to want to come back and fight for us. That they're not just pieces of meat. Exactly. That they're actually, you know, exactly. you care for them. Exactly. Now, Scott, are you going to have any open workouts where the fans locally could go over there and check them out before uh, before the fight? Right. Um, Jen uh, Wank, who handles all of our she PR, nod. is set up. <laughs> she just nodded. So uh, <laughs> over at Fozzie Sports at the LVAC on Lake Mead and Rainbow tomorrow at uh, 5 o'clock, we're going to have try to get Simon there first at 5 o'clock, and then we'll try and get Artem there at 6 o'clock, and we'll have uh, an opportunity for everyone to take photographs. And Is that the same place you did Yadson Clyde? Same yes. exact place. Yes. There was a good Excellent. turnout there, too. Yeah, we had a great turnout. Absolutely. And now, moving forward, big picture plans. You, you've kind of followed suit with what the UFC and MMA promotion has done by, just ca by, by establishing your own belt for your particular organization. You've got the TV deal. Are you going to follow suit in other capacities? Like, are we going to possibly see a Lion Fight promotion Muay Thai reality show? You know, oh, it's, good it's question. Because I love, I the, I yeah, love yeah. the contender, man. Yeah. I watched that first, the contender Asia. I loved it. Where Yachts and Clyde and JWP, John Wayne yeah. Parr fought. And I know they started doing a second one. Dwayne Ludwig actually flew out for it. Something happened. It got canceled. I know Artem Levin fought to get into the contender, and he has some belt. But we never saw that second one, but I just think there's a market for it. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, has been our on our radar right now. We're focusing on the fights, but we had a European group and another group that was interested in possibly doing something. So everything's on the table right now that's going to help us raise the profile of Muay Thai and Lion Fight in, in the United States. So well, sure. And how's Access TV? How, how have they, uh, you know, expressed their their love so far? Because I mean, from what I've seen, uh, you know, I know. 
I know how excited Pat Miletic was was able to be and Tom, and um, you know Michael Chiavello. Yeah, they were so excited to be able to, to call Muay Thai here in America. Uh, what's the response been from Access? Uh, they've been a great partner, Michael Chiavello. I can't think of a better spokesperson, better spokesperson for your sport than Michael Chiavello. Oh, the guy's yeah. very knowledgeable. <laughs> he He's, loves it. He, knows he loves it. it. He's into it and. Uh, you know, Pat Miletic uh, initially wasn't going to do our fight, and then he realized it was Muay Thai, and, and I met him at uh, the MMA Awards or somewhere, and he took a huge pay cut just to come do it because he really wanted to do our show. So that meant a lot to me, and uh, they've been they've done a tremendous job of promoting our fights and, and, and really getting behind it and obviously exercise the option, so they're going to be doing all of our fights in 2013. Awesome. Tell everyone what they get, what they can expect Friday night by coming out and watching the fights. You're going to see the best stand-up fighters in the world. Uh, it is uh, full rules Muay Thai, knees, elbows. You're going to see five amateur fights starting at five and uh, five of the best pro bouts that you're going to see starting at 7 o'clock. And if you can't make it to the Hard Rock, make sure you catch it on Access TV. Scott, thank you very much for coming in, brother. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Stitch. All right. Good luck, brother. Thanks. I can't wait, man. I awesome. love it. And what a, what a way to kick off the weekend. Right. What a way. You got Muay Thai fights Friday night, UFC on Saturday night. Fight weekend, man. I'm so excited. It's fight weekend here in Vegas. And the Muay Thai fights are in Vegas. UFC's in Montreal, but the vibe is definitely in the air. We got to go take a break and pay some bills. When we get back, we'll have a phone interview with UFC welterweight Jordan Mean. We'll break down UFC 158, get Heidi's hit list, and more. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920.
Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920. And joining us now on the Fight Corner, UFC welterweight Jordan Meehan. He'll be taking on Dan Miller this Saturday at UFC 158. Jordan, thank you very much. How are you, brother? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm super excited. Just got into Montreal today and checked the weight and uh, ready to go. Weight's good? Sure is. Not, not going to go out and hit up the buffet, are you? <laughs> no, that would just make it harder on myself. I don't want to be doing that. Hey, save that for after the weigh-ins, right? Absolutely. Now, how excited are you? Not only are you making your UFC, UFC debut, but you're doing it in Canada. Yeah, it's uh, the card that's set up here in, in Montreal is, is super stacked, and it's an honor to be on it. And, and to have my first fight in Canada is another bonus for me. So uh, I'm ready, and, and I'm super excited. Hey, do you follow the odds at all, the, the gambling, the odds in, in mixed martial arts and the fights? Oh, uh, not really, no. You are a 3-1 to one favorite in this fight. I don't want to put some pressure on your nerves, <laughs> but I just thought, you know, making your UFC debut, I've been a fan of yours. You know, we followed your fights all in Strike Force, and, and we've been a big fan of yours here on the show. But to make your UFC debut against a 12-fight veteran like Dan Miller and to come out as a 3-1 to one favorite, that, that says a lot about the, the fans' confidence in you as a fighter. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. A lot of my, a lot of my buddies are, are big batters, though. They know all about the odds. So, um, so yeah, I guess, I guess that's pretty sweet. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really do any betting on what all my buddies do, so I can leave it up to them. They, they, they can make the bets, and then they just kick you back for, for doing the hard work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we were also talking about George St. Pierre fighting in Montreal all the time, and you said this is your first fight in Canada. Are you expecting a loud crowd? Because you're going to get it, brother. Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've been to a, a St. Pierre fight in Montreal before, a UFC fight, and, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, the crowd, how loud they get and, and everything, and even even weigh-ins, everything is, is super, super packed. The, the fans love it. And, yeah, it's going to be crazy. Well, not only that, Phil, but the hotels, the the yes. lobby. It just 24-7, people are just jam-packed into the lobbies. And, you know, for a fighter to try to get into the elevator, it's going to take them about 30 minutes. Yeah, no doubt. There, there's some hardcore fans here. And that's what uh, I think makes it so sweet, fighting in <laughs> Montreal, is, yeah. is that aspect of it. Nothing wrong with that. Have you gotten that already? No. You, you said you're in Montreal now, right? Yep. Have you gotten? Have you when you showed up at the hotel? Was are, are you getting rushed already by fans for autographs? Oh no, not yet. No, but uh, I'm sure later on in the week it'll get a little, little bit more busy. But um, I'm not too, too well known yet. So my, my face is I'm pretty low key. I, I like the way you said that. In a week, it's going to get a lot better. Like you know <laughs> what's going to happen after Friday night, after Saturday night, you're going to get hounded for autographs. Yes, sir. And I have to say, listen, you know, your opponent, Joey, talked about it, a veteran of the sport, Dan Miller. Um, you know, he, he's been through the toughest of times in his career, um, but he's a fighter, and he's always always fights through it and sticks around. Uh, pri primarily a grappler. Um, you, though, your state, we were talking about this before the show, your stand-up and how impressive it is and the way you use those elbows. Um, but your wrestling, that's another thing that it's really come along over the last few fights. Uh, what have you been doing? To uh, is this constant wrestling drills? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it's it's constant. You know, everything for grappling, uh, stand up wrestling. Uh, we're drilling, drilling everything. So, um, obviously, uh, Dan, you've seen his guillotine in his in his fight. So we've been repping a lot of uh, just keeping a uh, good head head control and, and where to put your head and, and not uh, not put it in uh, vulnerable spots. Uh, he fought uh, Ricardo Funch, his last one, and, and uh, Ricardo was putting his head in some bad spots and capitalized on it. Actually dropped him a couple times. He got the, got the finish with his, with his uh, trademark guillotine. So, yeah, but we're constantly uh, working on everything. You know, one of the things that's most Im impressed me about watching you fight, and I, I was talking to, the, to Stitch about this before the show, is in, in the Cyborg fight, you know, you came out, orthodox and you switched to southpaw in the third round and then the woodley fight you came out 
Orthodox and fought primarily Orthodox that whole fight. And in the Tyler Stinson fight, you came out and you fought the whole fight as a Southpaw. And, and when you were an Orthodox fighter and when you were a Southpaw fighter, you looked smooth both ways. You looked like if I didn't know that you fought the other way, I would think you were naturally an Orthodox fighter or naturally a Southpaw fighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've just uh, just been trained since I was <clears throat> pretty young to um, to be able to switch sides and, and go both ways. And, and uh, against Stinson, I found that uh, uh, being Southpaw was in, in my favor. And, and uh, yeah, we could use the jab a bit more. And, and, uh, and I kept going back to the same punch to it so much. But yeah, it's, I think it's a big... Uh, beneficial to, to be able to switch it up and be comfortable both sides. Is that one of those things that when you guys sit down to game plan a fight, you watch film, and you and your dad say, you know what, look at the way this guy does this, look at the way this guy does this, we should fight him as an orthodox, or look at the way he does this, we should fight him as southpaw. Are these decisions made intentionally before camp in order to deal with certain opponents? Oh, yes and no, because you have to be able to adapt to uh, what's, what's going on out there, and uh, mainly if you're fighting a southpaw, just to, you know, it's a kind of a battle for staying on the outside of that lead leg and, and uh, you know, your right straight left hooks, your your power, not not so much your jab. Uh, it's when you switch and you're, and then you go um, southpaw yourself, you know, you can use your jab a little bit more if you're fighting a southpaw. So, um, yeah, we think about that before, but it's also, uh, um, just like I said, you have to be able to adapt you know, mid-fight. Joining us on the line, UFC welterweight Jordan Meehan. And Jordan, taking on Dan Miller, 12-fight veteran of the, uh, of the UFC. You knock him off, not to look past him, but let's say you do take him out when you do take him out. <laughs> um, mm, thank you. you you're, you're fighting on a card that's stacked with welterweights, and, and you know a lot of times when that happens, you know you can kind of see potential matchups here in the future. Uh, who on this card do would you want to fight next? Um, I would say uh, any any one of the welterweights. I got a list in my room that I, that I wrote down when I signed with UFC, and there's so many good guys. Um, and Miller, I think, is in right in mid pack of the welterweights at the, at the top of the list. So um, I'm I'm down for for whoever. I I just had this crazy image of my head. If I, you you a movie guy, Jordan? Uh, I am. Yeah, you you am. ever watch Billy Madison? <laughs> yes. I just pictured you as like Steve Buscemi, like with a list in your room, <laughs> crossing them off as you finish them. Minus the lipstick, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah minus the lipstick, of course. No, I didn't so want to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's the top of the list? Come on, give me a, give me one or two guys towards the top of the list. Well, I think uh, BJ Penn's the top, and then uh, obviously St. Pierre, Josh Koscheck, uh they just cut John Fitch. He was at the top there. Well, he, uh, just got names like that. Those guys have obviously been around forever. And do you, you ever you ever think of entertaining a rematch with uh, Rory McDonald? I mean, that was your very first loss from what I remember, right? Yeah, as a professional. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, that would be awesome if that uh, came about. It was too bad he got injured for this card. And would have liked to see that fight again his rematch with Condit there but uh, yeah if that uh, if that comes about I, I would love that well you know and your wish might just come true because that's one of the things with Joe Silva and the UFC is you know they pull no punches when matching guys you know they want to get the best with the best definitely and they want to uh, they want to entertain the fans and they want to give uh, give the fans what they want to see and I think that would definitely be up there for uh, an exciting match yeah, it's funny how you talk about, you know, how, however the fight goes, you know, most people will be ready to go again at the same time. You know, we saw it with the heavyweights when they put that heavyweight card together. This this card, I mean, you talk about 12 fights on the card, six of them are welterweight fights, and five of them are in the top seven. So, I mean, you've, you've, got, right. you've got so many welterweights in this card, and, and I'm hoping we see something more of, more of that in the future where we're seeing, you know, they, they fight around the same time so they're always ready to go and I think it would be much more exciting and now with like this fight like all right, one of the things we were talking about before was George St. Pierre being able to fight constantly at home you know and mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a disadvantage I look at that as not fair in, in my opinion but I mean when you look at a guy like a Johnny Hendricks and you know how close he is and he's the, the type of guy that 
possibly could beat GSP. Do you think that that's a fight that the UFC would have trouble selling, and that's probably why they're not putting it together? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's just this is kind of the fight that uh, that needs to happen. Uh, Diaz is the the next kind of contender, although Hendricks thinks he is, which which I agree. I think he is too. I think he's up there, but it's kind of uh, something that was kind of in the works before that never panned out and. But I think I think all those fights will eventually will eventually come out. I don't really think it's a I don't think they don't think they will sell it. I think with St. Pierre's name or Hendricks name wherever they are, I mean Texas, Johnny would sell lots of tickets and and uh, <laughs> get a good crowd. So maybe they would do it there at the Texas Dome there. That would be beautiful, but, Dallas uh, Stadium. That would be. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I don't mind it being in Montreal and I don't mind an Anderson Silva fight being in Brazil it's one of those things like you're the champ this is you got to go into their backyard to beat them and I, I don't mind it and I understand why they do it uh, and at the same time though I, I see what you're saying like for instance the Super Bowl is never on it's on neutral territory absolutely but the Super Bowl it's two different teams usually most of the time it's I've not always like looked at it, I've always looked at it as once that cage door closes nobody should have any advantage over anybody I agree with you on that yeah, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. You know, but I, I would, I would love to see Johnny Hendricks against George St. Pierre in Dallas. That would be, that that would sell out that place. I think. I mean, well, it seems like anywhere, anywhere fighting, fighting a Brazilian in Brazil, seems to be a bit of an advantage. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Do you think that that holds the same uh, for Canada? You know, a, a Canadian or a French Canadian in Montreal, do they have the same advantage fighting in Montreal that a Brazilian would have in Brazil? Oh, I think definitely to a certain degree. I remember when uh, St. Pierre fought Sarah for the second time. Oh, that was brutal. And, uh, yeah, the, even at weigh-ins, they wouldn't even let Sarah talk. Cause they were just booing him so bad, and he just kind of gave up. No, it that's true. It's it, pretty crazy. And, and, you know, I've been to all the fights in Canada, and, uh, yeah, they, they do have an advantage. Even if you're on the undercard, if you're from Canada and when they mention your name, the fans are going to be cheering. And not only that, but they, they, go oh, yeah. into, they go into those chants like they do in England yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. And, and when you get that on your side, there's a buzz, brother. So that there does is, have an effect on the fighter. Now, you fought, of course, in Strike Force. That's the biggest show to date. But stepping up to the UFC, that's, that's the big show. That's the big stage. You know, what are your thoughts on the alleged octagon jitters? Because you hear people say, how is he going to deal with the octagon jitters being mm -hmm. under the big lights? Do you think those even play 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 any role in your fight oh yeah definitely um the nerves and the, and the stress and the pressure i think uh definitely plays a role but uh i've said this before i think that's why you know getting the win and, and winning is, is makes it that much better because you you know you overcome uh, those fears and that pressure and and those nerves and i think that's all part of the fight game and uh yeah like i said that's what makes the, the win so much better one thing we like to do here on the Fight Corner is when there's a big fight car coming up, we like to do our own breakdown. And we're all broadcast journalists, analysts, so we give our particular insight. But I'd love to get you, you as a fighter, especially a welterweight fighter, uh, fighting on this card. I'd love to get your insight on the other welterweight matchups on the card. So what are your thoughts on GSP and Diaz? How do you see this fight playing out, and who do you think gets the W? Oh, I think uh, St. Pierre's explosiveness um, on his takedowns, on his jab, on you know a lot of his stand-up and and mainly his takedowns and then when he goes to the ground you know i think he's he's pretty good at not getting submitted so i think uh, i think st pierce is going to take the win on that and what about nate marcourt taking on jake ellenberger yeah that's super super uh, uh intriguing uh i mean marcourt I, I don't know if, i don't know if he's coming off a loss Eric there off, uh, after those leg kicks. I don't know how he's going to rebound after that. I'm sure he'll do fine. Um, but I would say um, I'd give it to uh, Marquardt maybe. I'd take him. Marquardt decision maybe. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because no one. Re I'm surprised that this fight was even booked. I did not think Marquardt would be walking for months. After that, yeah, fight. I know. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's funny that I, I talked to John Alessio after he fought Tiago Alves, and if you remember that fight, Tiago blasted his leg so bad they had to wheel John out when he left. He he was on Jeez. crutches for weeks, and John said it took him eight or nine, eight to nine weeks before he was walking back to normal. And this fight is taking place just about eight or nine weeks after 
Nate took the same sort of blasting in his legs that that John did. So it, it's a testament that he's even that he could even go back to a training camp that early, let alone come and fight. Well, let's see if he walks to weigh-ins on crutches. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the last fight, the last fight to wait on the card, uh, Carlos Condit taking on Johnny Hendricks. How do you see this one playing out? Yeah, I think um, the power of Johnny and uh, and uh, just his wrestling ability. I think it's really going to dominate, but uh, obviously you've seen Condit, uh, you know, compete with all the best. And it's crafty, but I think uh, Johnny, Johnny's going to take that one. So then, moving forward, are you predicting that uh, uh, after this, we'll see the next welterweight title fight will be GSP versus Johnny Hendricks? I think so. I think that's what's uh, what's going to happen. I hope so. I uh, hope you're right on that one. Yeah, I would love. And then also, then since you're the other welterweight on the card, you picked Marquardt. Maybe uh, you and Marquardt fight next? That would be just as uh, exciting for me. That would be awesome. <laughs> this I guy's like down that. to fight I anyone. Like I love it. Man, he's been, fight he's been fighting since he was, what, 16? All he knows. You've been fighting Absolutely, professionally yeah. since 16, right? Absolutely, yeah. Before that, even, you know, competing for a long time. So Phil, Phil was at home twiddling his thumbs, trying to get the nerve up to ask his girl to a sophomore dance. And he was drop kicking the doctor during the delivery. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's gearing up, ready to jump in the cage and fight a grown man. Yep, that, that's yes, the sir. difference. Yes, well, Jordan, hey, thank you very much for coming on the show. Before we let you go, do you want to shout out your sponsors or plug your Twitter? Yeah, check me out on Twitter, at FightingMeans. Um, on Facebook, my fan page, Jordan Meehan, and um, my website, jordanmeehan.ca. Uh, they got all my sponsors on there and some links and, and whatnot, so yeah, check it out. Awesome. Once again, good luck this weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you after you whoop some butt. Thanks for having me, guys. Good talking Thanks. to you. I, I, very interesting little fact I just read here, and I, I don't know if this is 100% correct, but in the 11 events the UFC has held in Canada, Canadian fighters are only 33 and 32. Wow. Okay. So about 50%. When, when facing opponents from other countries, there are seven Canada versus the world bouts on this card. All right. So I think, I think that's a very interesting fact when we're talking about the Brazil having more an advantage of Canada. Um, I remember who, there was one card, Joe, we were talking about, and I think it was like, I, there was 11 fights, and nine of them were Brazil versus whoever, and Brazil won every one of them. Yeah, yeah. You know? So this is, you know, may, maybe there isn't as big of a difference, but we will see because there's a lot of Canadian fighters fighting different uh, opponents around from uh, around the globe this Saturday night. Around the globe. Well, speaking of around the globe, let's get some MMA news from around the globe with Heidi's hit list. Okay, guys. So today, uh, last week we left you, and we were discussing whether or not Mark Hunt would in fact take that fight against Junior Dos Santos and it's happened. It is set to go down on May 25th at UFC 160 that'll be here in Las Vegas at the MGM. Also, another uh, fight added to that card after Ryan Bader was hurt. It's a big step up for James Tahuna who just came off a win over uh, Ryan Jimmo. He gets the opportunity to face number five ranked light heavyweight Glover Teixeira at UFC 160 also. So at one 61. We have a few fight signings there for Winnipeg, Canada at the MTS Center on June 15th. Igor Pokryak versus Ryan Jimmo, who we were just discussing was uh, Tahuna's last opponent. And also Mitch Clark versus John McGuire. That's in for UFC 161. The last fight that we have here, I'm sorry, is 158 this weekend. So Armando's trying to get in here behind me. I have to kind of scooch over. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> so we have for UFC 158, don't forget to watch the countdown special that's on Fuel tonight, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. Also, the Ultimate Fighter tonight is the last phase of this uh, part of the elimination bouts. We had Dylan Andrews versus Zach Cummings, and from what I hear, it is quite a fight, so make sure to tune in on FX at 9 p.m. That's Pacific and Eastern. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Yeah. I hate. I I'll tell you what though. I do hate the, the the 9 p.m. across the board stuff, you know. Or no, no. I I like that. I hate when it's on Bellator. And it's, I don't have that issue. Yeah, you got. What is that? Satellite? I have. I have Direct TV. I don't have that issue. What is the satellite? Ultimate you speak Ultimate of? Ultimate <laughs> Fighter is on at 6 p.m. for me. It's it's on right now at home. It's taping. I can go home right now and watch the Ultimate Fighter. I don't have to wait until later. Dude, you got to do it. And you got to get. Fu I mean, if you don't have Fuel TV, I don't. It, 
listen, they just need to rename it. It shouldn't even be. I know that they're going for Fox Two, but Fox Sports Two. But um, no, it's just, just UFC. UFC to- channel. That's all it is. It's <laughs> fights, fights, fights. You got. You got to get fuel. Well, we have 10 minutes left. We are not going to be doing our breakdown show on Friday because we'll be doing a remote for the Lion Fight promotions from the Hard Rock for the Fights Live. So what do you say we try to just knock out some of these fights and give a quick little breakdown? You want to run through it? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I just can't believe it's taken us this long. Let's be honest. I mean, we may have our opinion on how the fight's going to go, but we have not spoke about George St. Pierre finally fighting Nick Diaz at all. Dude. This is not, it's not even been discussed. I know, I know. And you know what, hold on. Not only have we not just talked about it, but there has been some awesome highlights, like from oh. the, the media call. <laughs> the media call may have, it may go down in comedy history. They're going to be playing that on Comedy Central 15 years down the road. The fact that George St. Pierre engaged in, in, in his version of trash talking was incredible. <laughs> was incredible. Oh. Wait, what, what was the, the funny thing was when uh, the, the media member asked George if, you know, uh, is everything Nick's saying about, are you pampered? And then before George could even answer, you're damn right he's pampered and he better be. If he's not, what the hell's like? Just Nick Diaz was just, and then you got George respond, you uneducated fool. I, I speak better English than you. <laughs> How awesome is that? Yeah, you know, that's the fight. The hype for this fight is just tremendous, and really that's what makes this whole fight right there. And, you know, when you get in there, I know you had talked and Phil had talked about George just kind of dominating my man Nick Diaz, but I don't see that. I I, I just don't see it if it's in a stand-up, and uh, only because Nick is so unorthodox with his hands. And and if George's defense doesn't improve like it did against Jake Shields, you might see some battering on that. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm on the other side, brother. I, I'm 100% on the side. I, I, think that, I think that Nick is good at what he does with unorthodox boxing, but I think that George's level of striking overall is so superior than Nick. I think Nick is so exposed in the striking element to defending oh, yeah. kicks. Oh, no, he takes he gets like hit all the his time. His leg kicks, his, the, the head kick, the body kick, he has zero defense against those. And I think the mobility of George mixed up with the, the head, body, kicking, and punching attack set up that takedown. And I, I just see George manhandling Nick Diaz. Wash, rinse, repeat. Yeah, Wash, GSP 101. It, re- it, it is going to be. And the one thing, like, what I, when I see this fight, I just want to see a finish. I want to see George St. Pierre go in there and finish somebody. Okay? I, I don't see him submitting Nick Diaz. I don't see him knocking him out. But I do see him possibly stopping the fight with cuts. Yeah, I think he slices him open. I, I think if you want to know what's going to happen... You want the words from Joe Stradamus? Because remember, I did, I did, I did come back once again and call the Hunt, uh, the Hunt JDS fight. So I'm two, I'm two and zero with my Joe Stradamus predictions. If you want to know what's going to go on, how this fight will play out, go back, watch Benson Henderson versus Nate Diaz, make it ten times bloodier and violent, and that's what's going to go down Saturday night in Montreal. Yeah, I, and that was a beatdown. I have to admit, you know that, uh, you know, poor Nate didn't have no leg checks, and I know Nick is the same way. They really kind of both fight the same way and they do and and the only advantage that nick would have is his offense and his offense is in the stand-up position and that's the only thing i'm saying if george has no defense for for nick's hands then then he might you know he might get bruised up a little here and there i gotta t- i gotta share this quote with you this is uh this is this is from nick, this is from nick diaz telling a story in the media call and he goes so so and, I, and i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna censor this for yes, you so he please. says Check this out, Mother Ducker. I pull up to a stoplight the other day, and some effing 40-year-old soccer mom sticks her head out the window and says, I hope GSP beats your ass. We're an effing Lodi, bitch. Can I say that? I did. Are you serious? I'm living in a small town full of people who hate me over here. I love it. Yeah, that was that was kind of fun. And Diaz, like, I, I wouldn't say he was in rare form because he's done this before, but never really, like, straight out in the media, like, it just... Like interrupting GSP, answering all his questions. Diaz is fired up on another level, and it was one of the things leading up to this was is is he in, Diaz, in George's head? Is Nick Diaz in George St. Pierre's head? No, I don't think so. No. Now way. that I think about it, and George said it. You know, this is the same song and dance. Koscheck was the same way. He said, I I I have a shorter list of, of people who weren't disrespectful. I would say it would take less time to name those people because it's the same song and dance. Everybody does this to me. Nobody respects me. 
but they find out what goes wrong when they get into the cage. So do you think that's Nick's defense or his offense is, is to be like this and try to get it in his head? It's trash talk. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. It's the psychological warfare. And I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's intentional or if that's just how he is in life. No, no. It, it, <laughs> that's it's, how it's, it's how he leads up to a fight because when he did the same thing with Shamrock, remember uh, Frank Shamrock? Yeah, oh yeah. And he's flipping him off and he's slapping Shamrock's hand away. What happened when that fight ended? After Diaz beat him down, he bent over and he picked Shamrock up and he was like, stand up, man, you're a legend. You know, it's all the hype for him. From what, I under from what I've heard, Nick Diaz is a real nice guy. Okay, it's, all in a, it's just all, you know, how he builds himself up for a fight. Now, do you think, okay, so do you think it's almost like Chael Sonnen? Because Chael Sonnen, that we, we're talking trash to Anderson Silva, that's not who Chael Sonnen is. No. He's a nice guy. He's a charming guy. He's careful. He's compassionate. The guy we see coaching the TV show is Chael Sonnen. The guy pre fight selling the Anderson Silva fight, that's just going salesman. Is Nick Diaz doing the same thing there where he's trying to sell fights, or is Nick Diaz trying to hype himself up where he has to get into that so he can fight like that? You know, I, I personally think that Nick is trying to hype himself up, and that's how he does it, and you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I've seen Nick on the outside, and, and I've seen the good side of him, so I know there's a little good side, but there's also a strange side to him. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and, and that I understand, you know, because I have a lot of my friends that are like that, so I understand where he's coming from. But, yeah, I think that, you know, he's trying to pump himself up for this fight, and it doesn't really take a whole lot of pumping up because this is going to be a fight. I think George is pissed, man. I don't think George is. I don't think he's in his head. I think George is just focused, focused aggression, focused anger. One of the funniest trends on Twitter of all time took place last week, and that was GSP's dark side. You know, the talking about GSP having a dark side, and then all of a sudden you're seeing people like, I use a spoon to take out my jelly, my dark side. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or just silly things like that. Or I, uh, I did not floss tonight, my dark side. You know, I don't know if they're – I think George is too smart of a fighter. I don't think he lets emotions take over. I think, yes, I do believe he's pissed, but I don't think it's going to matter. I think once that cage door closes, all right, I know what I have to do, and I know what I'm going to do, and he's going to do it over and over and over again. Yeah, I don't think it's going to affect – I think it will play a role, but not in a negative matter. I think it's just going to be like that extra fuel that makes him that much more focused, that much more sharp, that puts that much more bad intention on everything he does. Because let's be honest, he's a pretty nice guy. And he goes mm -hmm. out there and he fights and he tries to do damage. But there's a difference when someone's trying to do damage and when someone has bad intention on everything they do. Yeah, the you know? he wants to make it permanent. Yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Absolutely. Look at Josh Koscheck's eye. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So brutal. And, and with he, the was, angry. And with he the was angry. He was angry with Koscheck. So, you know... It, is it going to affect? I don't know, but I, I still think it's going to be the same thing. Like wash, like we said, wash, rinse, repeat. Take down, elbow, punch, <laughs> knee to the body, over and over again. You heard it here. Well, we are all out of time. We want to thank Scott Kent for stopping by, Jordan Meehan for the phone interview. Remember to get all your MMA news from MMAFightCorner.com. Follow us on Facebook. Check out our YouTube page. we got tons of cool content. Our field reporter, Heidi Fang, she's out in the streets getting the inside scoop, talking to the biggest and brightest MMA stars in the planet. Also, follow us on Twitter at MMA Fight, excuse me, at Fight Corner. Follow me at Joey V MMA. Phil at Filthy Divine. That's P-H-I-T-H-I-L-T-H. -I, I can't spell your damn name. <laughs> Filthy Divine. Follow Heidi Fang at Heidi Fang. Stitch, you're at Stitch Duran. At Stitch Duran, yes. At Stitch Duran. Everybody, thank you very much for listening. We won't be here. We're preempted Friday, but we'll have a live remote from the Hard Rock. So tune in then and also tune in Tuesday, 6 to 7, because it's like going to college for your MMA knowledge. The MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920. We need two hours. Damn, that's good. Yeah. Ten, ten minutes. We, we need two hours. Yeah, she said we could stay for it. I got a lesson at 8. No, no, so I, I mean, yeah, no, we need two hours.